Yan, hello and good afternoon teachers at magandang magandang hapon po ano, to, uh, to all our teachers who are watching our live stream for today. Okay, so teachers, bago tayo mag-start no, at bago tayo magsimula para sa session natin for today, I'd like to invite first everyone to please do share our link no, to your social media accounts no, in Twitter, Instagram, uh, TikTok, or uh, in Facebook no, so that we can invite more teachers in our live stream for today kasi ang dami nating makukuha for our session for today. And I'm sure of that. No? Um, well, number one, given our topic for today. And second, I can definitely vouch for our speaker for today. And one of the best and one of the uh, people that I look up to when, um, when still he was uh, teaching. No? And of course, no, uh, an administrator in Saver School. Okay? So, something to look forward to. Pero bago yung teachers, so again, invite natin yung ating mga colleagues, co-teachers no, to join our live stream. But of course, no, kung hindi po tayo makaka-join for our session for today, we'd also like to greet those that will be doing a replay of this session. Because we know it's a Thursday and um, ano no, uh, tight yung schedule natin. And of course, alam ko yung mga teachers natin ngayon, medyo uh, puno ng documents for the preparation for a face-to-face -face setup in our uh, country. No? But before we go into our topic for today, I'd like to first greet our teachers who are in the chat. No? So please uh, send your names, your schools. Um, so I can do a, a very quick shout out. No? We will not like do a very long one. Well, number one, I'm only one today. No, I don't have my co-administrators okay, to, uh, to switch. No? And of course, we'd like to reserve much of our time for today no? to our speaker who will be sharing with us no? uh, a very valuable topic for today. So I'd like to greet first. Good afternoon to our teachers in the chat. No, teacher Maria Selina Botyong. Okay, of course, teacher Jeffrey Beltran is always there. No, kahit may class pa yata yan. Teacher Jeffrey. Teacher uh, Glenda Aloran, always here. Pastor Manny Garcia, thank you for always blessing our community. Okay, teacher uh, Lourdes Santa Juana. Teacher Marvin Francisco. Teacher Carol Sombria. Teacher Reyes Dolian. Teacher uh, Dolian Reyes. No, teacher Melanie Dalingay. Teacher Regina. Rose Rigidor, Teacher Jeril, Jeril May Pekaza, okay? Teacher Dean Clifford Wame, always there as well. Teacher Crimson Lyons, Teacher Ronaline O. Alcaide, Teacher Ka Kate Alerta, Teacher Jomer Segovia, Teacher Harley Hales Channel, no? Please do subscribe to Teacher Harley, Harley Hales Channel, baka marami rin tayong makuha dyan. Teacher uh, Mar uh, Mar Mark Anthony Esguera, Teacher Concepcion Dulay, Teacher Maria Concepcion Arellano, Teacher Justado Quiber, Teacher Chloe Napot Napolitano, Teacher Joseph Odelon Hermitano, as always, never absent, Teacher Gemma Rivera, Teacher Angela Arellano, Teacher Lord Lena, okay, I'm also again no, looking forward to your insights, Teacher Lord Lena, Teacher Char Charmaine Joyce Tumakder, and Teacher Myra uh, May Debar, okay, Teacher Andy. Padernelia, and of course, I'll end with Teacher Roni Shane Compuesto. And for the rest of uh, us here in the chat right now, in our live stream, magandang magandang hapon po and welcome to our session for today. Okay, so teachers, kid, para sa araw na to, no, um, very special ang ating session because we have a very special guest, no, uh, ibang time zone pa siya, no, and of course, um, very busy person and still was able to accommodate our request. So without much uh, um, no, no, uh, delay anymore, okay, let us welcome our speaker in our stream. Uh, but for, before that, no, let me first introduce him. Okay? So our speaker for today um, is uh, someone that I really know okay? and uh, I work with. Okay? So our speaker for today, Sir Brian Maranya, okay? is an educator who aims to provide learning experiences that provoke inquiry, reflection, and transformation. He began his, uh, this mission professionally in 2004 as a recruiter for the Beijing Center for Chinese Studies, a study abroad program for the college students around the world. In 2006, Mr. Maranya moved to the Philippines in 2006 to teach religion at Saver School, a private high school in Metro Manila. In 2009, he assumed the role of international programs coordinator, designing a series of six-week language and culture immersion study abroad programs known as the Savior China Experience or otherwise known as XEE. From uh, 2012 to 2015, he has also served Savior School's International Baccalaureate Diploma Program Coordinator. Mr. Maranya, 
moved back to Baltimore in 2015 to teach theology at his alma mater, Loyola Blakefield. In 2017, he took on the role of assistant principal of academics. And in 2000, uh, 2021, he became the upper school principal. He has an undergraduate uh, degree in the interdisciplinary studies, philosophy and psychology from uh, Loyola University in Maryland, and a master's degree in basic education from the Ateneo de Manila University. He is currently pursuing an education doctorate at John Hopkins uh, University with specialization in mind, brain, and learning. So exciting, Prof. Let's welcome our speaker for today, Sir Brian, into our stream. Uh, Sir Brian, hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Magandang hapon sa inyong lahat at salamat, Franco, sa introduction at sa opportunity para present uh, itong topic na to, ng global education. If it's okay, I, I will present uh, mostly in English. Uh, as you heard from uh, Sir Franco just a minute ago, I, I was born and raised here in the U.S. Uh, it's still morning here, but the limpai, <laughs> 5, uh, oh, 5 a.m. here uh, in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, but born and raised here in the United States. And if uh, in just a moment here, I will share my screen so we can get going. Uh, and Sir Franco, if you can see my screen. Yeah, I can see it right now, sir. Okay. Beautiful. Okay, yeah. great. So, um, sir Brian, uh, we'll give you the floor now. Uh, teachers, uh, enjoy the session. Uh, sir Brian, good luck. Uh, for our teachers, please be reminded that this is a certified session. So you'll, go, you'll be getting a certificate for this session upon accomplishment of the evaluation form. Okay, I'll be in the chat. I'll be engaging you in the chat. No? If you have questions, concerns, I'll also be there. Okay, so good luck, Sir Brian. Great. Thank you, Franco. Thank you. Uh, and welcome, everyone. Again, I'm very excited to be here to talk about uh, a topic that is very important to me uh, personally and professional, uh, professionally. Uh, the topic is about global education. Uh, how do we promote global citizenship? How do we promote greater cultural diversity and awareness of cultural diversity in our programs, in our classrooms, uh, and uh, to some extent also in our everyday lives? You know? uh, so the presentation this afternoon will be divided into four sections about my, my personal influences and what drew me into um, this field of global education. I'll then talk about how, uh, my time with uh, Sir Franco at Xavier School uh, and, the, and the good work that we did uh, uh, there um, and the many activities that we had uh, at Xavier School, uh, which in many ways I, I think helped me appreciate um, the possibilities for uh, global education. Um, third, I'll talk a little bit about what the academic research says uh, about international mindedness, global citizenship, um, and related concepts, um, because um, there are some frameworks uh, to, to think about in, in uh, relation to global citizenship. Um, and then finally, I want to talk about these concepts of diversity, equity, and inclusion, which um, are quite um, uh, important worldwide, uh, but are of special significance here in the United States. And there's a, a lot of work uh, happening here in the U.S., around uh, what is called DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, and it's quite integrated and tied into global mindedness. So I'll talk about how I see some of the connections there. Uh, and along the way, uh, I will also ask for a little bit of your context. And I will ask uh, every once in a while for your input um, there in the chat, uh, your thoughts, your experiences, uh, your ideas also, uh, because I, I see the richness of this uh, community and want to take advantage of that uh, uh, as well. You know? um, so uh, we'll start with that. We'll start with uh, with with context. I, I would just want to know a little bit, uh, what brings you here? What do you hope to learn? Maybe what questions you have? Uh, any one of those questions which you feel uh, comfortable uh, answering? Um, I will not be able to, uh, you know, to, to read or respond perhaps to everyone, but I, I'm curious, uh, just broadly speaking, um, what brings you here to this uh, to this webinar on a Thursday afternoon uh, evening? Uh, uh, what do you hope to learn uh, and achieve other than the certificate that that Sir Franco mentioned? Um, and and what questions maybe do you have that I can begin to address uh, over the course of the next hour or so? Uh, please uh, place those uh, in the chat, uh, and uh, I'd be happy to to uh, read along and uh, join the conversation. So 
any one of those questions that you would like to answer, please place those in the chat now. Yeah. Hello, Sir Brian. No, yeah. yes. We already have some answers in the chat. No? Medyo may delay lang ng konti, Sir Brian. Okay. We have sure, a 10 no seconds, 15 seconds delay sa uh, I see. YouTube natin. Yes. yes. Okay. Not a but problem. there are already some answers. Um, uh, This one is from teacher Regina Rose Rigidor. Um, To hear know our fellow educator experience on virtual learning from the other side of the world. Okay. So, medyo sure. siguro nagkaroon na ng typing na si teacher Regina. Okay. Okay. Ayun, baka nagta-type yeah. lang sir no kasi masyadong seryoso magsumagot ng mga teachers natin mahabang magano. <laughs> sige, sige, sige lang. Sige lang. No problem. Sige, we'll, we'll go ahead uh, and please if you have other questions and and uh, I hope at some point I will be able to uh, address them no. So, uh but uh at, at uh, perhaps towards the end I'd like to be able to address this question about the virtual learning and and some of our experiences here. Um okay, and and some other uh points here about expanding knowledge. Uh, about cultural diversity in the classroom and, and otherwise. Good. Uh, so I, asking a little bit about your context uh, and what brings you here, because I'd like to talk a, a little bit about that first, uh, as I mentioned. So what brings me here? No? Uh, and uh, other than uh, Sir Franco and, and all the good work um, is uh, some experiences that I've had in my life. Uh, and it, many of the experiences um, led me on, on a journey uh, around the world, uh, as it were. Um, and which which I'd like to talk a little bit about. Uh, it was mentioned earlier that uh, I went to Loyola Blakefield, uh, which is currently also where I am the upper school principal, high school principal, junior, uh, uh, senior high school principal. And um, this school is in Towson, Maryland, just outside of uh, Baltimore, Maryland, uh, about an hour, about an hour and a half away from Washington, D.C., so the, uh, the mid-Atlantic east coast of the United States. Um, my parents, uh, both of them, were born and raised in the Philippines. Uh, my, my father in Manila, my, my mother in uh, Pampanga, um, but I was born and raised here in the United States. Um, and um, in fact, just a few miles away from uh, the school, Loyola uh, was the hospital where I was born. Um, and I grew up here uh, on the east coast of, uh, of the United States um, for all of my life. Um, and when I was in seventh grade, uh, I went to Loyola Blakefield, which is a, a, a Jesuit Catholic um, all boys school. Um, and uh, it was here that I got my first start really um, in, you know, so many things in terms of learning, but really also in, in terms of global education. It was in my uh, senior year, my grade 12 year at Loyola Blakefield, uh, where I joined a, um, a short trip to Italy uh, with some of my classmates and with the teacher and uh, we went to uh, to Venice and Rome, um, and it really opened my eyes to the wider world, to what was possible, to uh, to travel. And I said to myself that that I wanted to continue travel. Um, I wanted to continue have travel and um, study abroad be perhaps a part of my college experience. Um, and in fact, it was one of the things that I considered when I went to uh, Loyola University, which was just down the road uh, from uh, Loyola Blakefield. Uh, and Loyola University was a Jesuit, uh, is a Jesuit university as well. Um, and it was there that, uh, as uh, Sir Franco mentioned, uh, I studied psychology and philosophy. Um, so uh, I was very much into asking the, the big questions and thinking about the big ideas of meaning and of purpose and why we are here and what makes us, uh, what makes uh, you know, humanity what it is, right? And um, those were many of the questions that I was pondering. Uh, at the same time, I was I was very much looking to to study abroad. Loyola University has uh, a quite robust robust program for international travel and international education. Most um, university students at Loyola will go and, and join that program at some point in their junior year, their third year of university. So that's something that I was thinking about uh, and something that I was hoping for, um, and uh, you know, very much enjoying my my time at Loyola. Uh, one thing that I, I want to point out, both at Loyola Blakefield, the high school, and at Loyola uh, University of Maryland, uh, both institutions at the time uh, were about um, 85 to 90 percent white students, uh, with only 10 or 15 percent non-white student, um, less than 4 percent Asian student. 
Um, so not only was I very often the only Filipino student in the classroom, very often I was the only Asian in the classroom. Um, now, this is uh, not usual in the United States. So the United States uh, at the time as a whole was probably uh, about 70% white, 30% non-white. Um, and so the fact that uh, Loyola High School and Loyola University uh, were 85 to 90% white um, uh, meant that the cultural diversity of the school uh, was less than the, the broader uh, population of the United States. Um, I'll talk about that towards the, the latter uh, quarter of my, in my presentation and how that influenced me uh, and, and continues to influence me in terms of how I see the world, how I educate, how I interact with my colleagues uh, and even my students. Um, but that's certainly part of the piece of my experience uh, as an educator is as a student being an ethnic minority um, and being somewhat removed, not, not only from other Filipinos, but even from my own parents. So my parents raised me speaking only English. They did not teach me Filipino. Uh, I only would know a few words here and there. Um, and uh, and uh, so that was something that, uh, that also was uh, uh, so somehow missing, uh, I think, from my, uh, from my early education, right? So uh, very, my education was very rich in some ways. Uh, I very much enjoyed my time at Loyola. Uh, high school and Loyola University, uh, but that was something that was uh, that was missing uh, missing in my education. No, uh, is this uh, this piece of uh, connection to Filipino culture, right? Um, so here I am uh, in 2000, 2001, 2002, asking these big questions about uh, life and philosophy, and um, hoping to travel, hoping to get back to Italy. Um, but in my sophomore year of uh, of uh, university, my second year of of, of uh, college, um, we had the 9-11 attacks uh, in the United States. Um, and this was obviously a, a, a global event, something that uh, was in the news everywhere, but uh, struck particularly close to home in a, in a few ways. Um, so I had uh, a tita in New York who was a nurse um, who was actually at a hospital that, that could see uh, the, the, the Twin Towers falling. And her daughters were in, in middle school. Uh, public middle school in New York City, and she was wondering um, where they were and, and were the subways safe. Uh, my older brother was uh, not too far from Washington, D.C., and my kuya at that time could actually see the smoke from the Pentagon, the plane that had hit the, the Pentagon. And then at my university, Loyola University, um, I had uh, a number of classmates um, who are, were from New York uh, and New Jersey and whose uh, family members uh, lived and worked in New York. Um, I had classmates uh, whose parents uh, died in the 9-11 attacks. Um, and so in our community, we, we felt it very, very strongly. Um, and all of a sudden, these uh, my world view shifted. Um, you know, I was enjoying my time in college um, and I felt, you know, as a, as a university student, quite innocent and, and just enjoying you know, time to think and to learn and to study and to make friends. Um, and this was a, a wake up call in, in many ways. Um, and so I still wanted to study philosophy and still study psychology, but there was perhaps more urgency. So this question of why do people do what they do became even more important to me. And one of the things that my professors at Loyola would say is, OK, we need to understand what's happening. And remember that people around the world, even some of these terrorists, it's not mental illness. So let's try to understand what is happening, what went wrong. Um, let's try to understand what are the cultural divides, what are the religious divides, what are the national divides that lead to these kinds of conflicts that are threatening our, our homes, um, that are threatening our lives. And so in many ways, I then uh, had a, a I still the core idea of wanting to uh, explore the world, still the core idea of wanting to understand the world um, and what makes people tick. But now uh, there was the greater urgency and a greater sense of importance, a greater sense that uh, that my life was being called in, in this direction. Um, and so when I thought about studying abroad, I, I wanted to go to a place that perhaps would give me something even more to learn, some something that would stretch me more, something that would asked me to go farther out of my, uh, my comfort zone. And I saw an opportunity to study abroad in China. 
which was completely foreign to me at that time. Uh, at that time, uh, you know, my parents were from uh, the Philippines, uh, obviously, but I had no background in Chinese language or in Chinese culture. Um, and I remember even flying on the airplane to, to China, um, remembering that uh, that um, I, I did not even know <laughs> where on the map was Beijing and I was flying to Beijing. Um, and so I spent six months in China. Um, and those months were um, some of the some of the more formative months uh, of my adult life, uh, to, to be um, to be frank, to be honest. Um, and it was in that uh, time in China where um, every day I would have to, uh, you know, even to do basic functions, to, you know, to buy soap or shampoo at the at the grocery store. I had to figure out in Chinese. And of course, at a time before smartphones, before I could look up the word for shampoo in Chinese, <laughs> I had to figure out how to navigate that. You know, I had to go into the store and, you know, mime taking a shower, you know, and, 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 and somehow make sure I could get what I, what I needed. It was very, very uncomfortable. It was very, very difficult. And I learned uh, just how uh, differently uh, Chinese culture was than uh, American culture in particular, um, but Western culture more broadly speaking. Um, the language was so different. Um, the, the, the assumptions, uh, the food, uh, the way of, uh, of moving around, uh, the way of, uh, of speaking, of, of music, every aspect of society was so different from what I was uh, accustomed to. Um, and at the same time, I could see that many of the stereotypes that I had of Chinese people were simply not true. Um, and many of the stereotypes that I encountered of my uh, Chinese friends um, that they had of Americans uh, were, were also interesting and also many times not true. Um, and so I, I went to, uh, to China. I had this experience of, uh, of, of really being, again, stretched. Um, and I came back thinking that was the most powerful learning experience that I had had in my life um, of being uncomfortable, of questioning my values, of questioning my beliefs. Um, this was a country, and I grew up uh, Catholic, uh, and this was a country where 1 billion people, 1.3 billion people, uh, largely have no religion and have an entire life that is largely atheist. Um, and, uh, and if there is religion, it, it is rooted in either Buddhism or has traces of Taoism or Confucianism, things that were very, very different um, from, from what I experienced. No. Um, so uh, you, you see here some pictures uh, from my time in China. Now they're on the left, um, you know, walking a certain portion of the Great Wall of China, uh, you know, and exploring some of those uh, uncharted paths. Uh, in the upper right, uh, that was uh, a horse riding adventure in, in Sichuan province, uh, uh, where uh, for four four days and for three nights, uh, some friends and I uh, rode, rode horses into the, the, the mountains and, and, and fields of Sichuan province. Uh, and then in the bottom right uh, was uh, Shanghai uh, in 2002, uh, much less developed than it is now. No. Um, but so those those were some of the experiences that were um, that were informing my experience, right? Informing my my time. Um, all of those led me um, really to to think about a career in international education. Um, and in fact, the organization that I was uh, uh, working with, with uh, the Beijing Center for Chinese Studies. Uh, I went to work for them afterwards. So uh, Franco mentioned that I was a recruiter for the Beijing Center. And so um, in the two years after my college graduation, I traveled around the world, but mostly around the United States, um, recruiting other students to join the same program. Um, and so during the school year, I was presenting about the, my experiences and presenting about uh, China. Um, and then in the summertime, uh, I would return to China uh, and study some Chinese language. And there's a question, if I still remember Chinese words, uh, yes, uh, yes, uh, right? so I still speak some Chinese, I haven't forgotten uh, too much, I still remember some. Um, and uh, you'll see where I have had opportunities still to, to practice Chinese. Um, but I want to pause there and, uh, and invite uh, others to consider and to, to, again, type into the chat. Um, if, there ex if there are experiences that you have had that have shaped your journey to become an educator, number one, and number two, that maybe have shaped your desire to learn more about global citizenship. Um, and so there was a question earlier about this, uh, about virtual learning no? and, and this pandemic. Um, 
you know, maybe this pandemic has invited you to, to think more about engaging uh, in global education or, or taking advantage of, uh, of global citizenship and global ideas. You know? um, maybe there were other experiences that you've had in your life uh, that have led you to, to uh, become an educator. Um, so uh, I invite you to take just a few moments here to pause, reflect on your own experience. What were some of the events that shaped your journey to become an educator? Or are there any events, historical events, uh, that shaped your desire uh, to learn about global citizenship or cultural diversity? Um, I, you know, uh, sometimes uh, my mother and, and even my wife will talk about the experience um, of not being from Manila. No? Uh, my my uh, uh, my wife is uh, from Leyte, um, and so you know, speaking Visaya, right? And being from um, the Visayas region, um, sometimes there's some differences living in Manila. No, um, so uh, maybe you know those experiences of being somehow not in the majority. Maybe those experiences are part of your experiences as well. Um, and if so, uh, please uh, type those into the chat as well. Events that shaped your journey and any events that shaped uh, your desire to know more about global citizenship. Okay. Um, so yeah, some are saying, for example, the internet, simply having the internet, no, it's giving a greater sense of, of global awareness, right? Um, uh, certainly that's true, right? When I was in, in, in high school, uh, wala pang internet noon, wala pang chat. Um, and so the sense of connecting with other people was not quite as, as profound, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, good. Uh, all right. So uh, what happened was in 2006, after two years of recruiting for the Beijing Center, um, I began to think about my own cultural heritage. Um, there was a moment when I was with my parents in China um, taking them around, and uh, and they were visiting for the first time, and we were in a taxi, and uh, I was in the front seat, and they were in the back seat, and they were speaking to each other uh, in Filipino, and I didn't understand what was being said, so I started speaking with the taxi driver in Chinese, uh, and we were having a conversation in Chinese, and my parents were having a conversation in the back in Filipino, and uh, my mother started laughing, uh, and uh, she started saying, um, uh, you know, this is, this is so amusing. And I said, well, what, what exactly is, uh, is so amusing to you? And she said, I just can't believe that, you know, you're having a, a conversation in Chinese. I have no idea what you're saying, like, but you don't understand what we're saying. Yeah. And you're Filipino. Right. And so we, we laughed about that, but it really got me thinking, oh, I know I am able to, to travel around China. I'm able to speak some Chinese. Um, but, uh, but what about my own culture? What about my own heritage? Um, and so I, I really wanted to spend some time um, living in the Philippines. I thought that it's somehow not right you know, for me as a Filipino to, to know more about the world and know more about these other cultures, but not know about my own heritage and my own parents and, and my own ethnicity. Um, and so in 2006, I moved uh, to the Philippines and um, I applied. I, again, I'm from a Jesuit high school, a Jesuit college. And so... Um, uh, I, I reached out and uh, and the, the Jesuits said, oh, there's a Jesuit school here. And in fact, it's a school uh, that that um, has some connection to China also. And that's called Savior School. It's a school for Chinese Filipinos in uh, San Juan, Green Hills, uh, Metro Manila. And uh, and so I went there um, as a as a religion teacher. Um, so I was very involved in, in campus ministry and as a philosophy major. I thought I would try teaching uh, religion. And that's how I got my start at Savior School as uh, as a religion teacher. So I started teaching religion there, um, and as it turned out, the school had um, a a program for study abroad in China. Uh, so this is uh, Xavier students, um, you know, born and raised in the Philippines, and they're developing programs to to bring students uh, to China. Um, and the president of the school at the time, Father Johnny Go, asked me if I would be willing to to help with this, uh, these, these programs, uh, which, uh, of course, I, I didn't even go to Savior to do that, but uh, it was a wonderful marriage of my experience and now my opportunity at, at, at Savior School. Um, 
just a word about Savior School. It, it, I think it, it was interesting that um, Savior itself, uh, but really the Philippines, more broadly speaking, has such an, a global right, and international foundation. Um, and so Savior School uh, was founded uh, by Jesuits, mostly European Jesuits, in fact, Spanish Jesuits, um, who had been missioned to China. And when they uh, could no longer teach in China because China uh, became communist, they fled to the Philippines. Um, and so we have a school for the Chinese in the Philippines taught by Spanish Jesuits, uh, and very kind of global beginnings uh, for this school. Um, and and I, I think about that often, uh, just in the Philippine context of you know, hundreds of years of Spanish colonization, uh, and then uh, almost 100 years of, of uh, well, 100 years certainly of American influence, uh, if not direct, uh, you know, um, involvement in, in political affairs, uh, Japanese influence, Chinese influence. Um, and so Filipino culture and history uh, is also so global, right? Uh, and, and there are some opportunities there. Um, so that was what was happening at, at Savior. And in fact, in 2008, um, the school developed uh, an international programs office. So the school recognized that the world is becoming more and more global, more and more connected. Uh, things like the internet um, has been bringing everything together. You know? And so the school should respond. Uh, how can the school respond in, in a world that is becoming much more uh, interconnected? And so initially the vision of this international programs office uh, is to make sure that all students who graduate have some form of cross-cultural awareness that enables them to thrive and understand a diverse and interconnected world, right? How can we prepare our students not only to be successful in the Philippines, how can we, how can we prepare them to, to navigate a world in which they will encounter people from all kinds of different backgrounds, uh, from uh, all kinds of different cultural and national and, and linguistic backgrounds? Um, and so the mission of this program was to provide opportunities for direct interaction between Xavier students and non-Savior students, quite, quite simply, right? Um, I, I'm going to go through some of the initiatives here. Uh, and uh, I want to, to, to pause and say one disclaimer, which is um, that uh, I understand that not every school will be able to do uh, all of these initiatives. Uh, in, in fact, even now, my school here at Loyola in Maryland, uh, I think is still not able to achieve some of the things that Savior School is able to achieve. Um, but I, I, I want to pause to say there are some good lessons to be learned um, from these experiences. Uh, and, and so um, there are some really exciting initiatives that I'm going to share. Uh, but um, whether or not the schools will, will be able to, uh, to arrange these, uh, these programs in the long run uh, is not something to worry about. And I'll, I'll talk about that later. Uh, but I just want to present first what these initiatives for, uh, were. No. Okay, at the heart of the Savior School International Programs Office uh, were a series of programs called the Savior China Experience. Now, the Savior China Experience was a six-week program in China. I, I mentioned that when I moved to Savior, they already had this uh, kind of exchange in China. It was for grade seven students who would spend six weeks in, uh, at that time in, in, in southern China. Um, and again, being a Chinese school, for many of the students, is a, it was a way for them to reconnect. Uh, so it was a moving experience for me personally as a Filipino born in America, reconnecting to Filipino roots, but then journeying with these Savior students who were born in the Philippines, reconnecting to their Chinese roots. You know? So uh, six weeks program in China, um, there was a, a focus on language and culture classes. Um, and so the students would take maybe two hours uh, or three hours of Chinese uh, language a day, um, they would learn some Tai Chi, they would learn some Chinese calligraphy, um, but then they, we would still want them to move forward with their regular curriculum. Um, and so what we designed were a series of uh, interdisciplinary projects um, that would allow them to engage their experience in China. Um, there was a real emphasis on experiential learning in these programs uh, and, um, and allow them to explore in some depth. And I'll, I'll talk more about that uh, because there were eventually three different locations, three programs. Um, so for example, uh, you, you see some cultural exposure there. 
uh, that's called the Longmen uh, Grottoes in, uh, in, um, in central China, in the upper picture. In the lower picture, uh, that's actually some of the Xavier students. Um, they had researched um, all about uh, culture and business in China. And at the end of their six weeks uh, uh, stay there, they presented their learning to the Philippine embassy in China. Right. So rather than the presentation simply being to the classroom or to the teachers, uh, we brought them to the Philippine embassy um, uh, it, there in Beijing and they presented their findings uh, about what they had researched over the previous six years right there to the uh, embassy. And um, the, the officials um, and the consulate uh, members of the Philippine embassy uh, asked questions and also gave their perspectives on, on China and the Chinese business, um, Chinese culture. Um, and we wanted that idea of, OK, we have an opportunity here to learn in another environment. Let's not spend all the time in the classroom. You know, let's really spend some time out in the world. Let's spend some time engaging people and really uh, taking uh, advantage uh, of, of um, these experiences. No. Um, so the first program I mentioned, Southern China, um, uh, was in Fujian province, um, Southern China, where many of the, the Chinese Filipinos currently in the, in the Philippines, many of them are from Fujian province. Um, but in fact, in Fujian province, you can find an SM. Uh, so there's SM uh, Fujian uh, there in, uh, in, in, in Xiamen uh, city, um, but a very a culturally rich city as well um, and, and, and beautiful in terms of the, the history. Um, but for this program, uh, there's uh, emphasis on, on language, obviously, and on culture. Uh, but uh, one thing that we found interesting is um, the students they love going to uh, to shop, right? They love going to the markets and uh, for whatever it might be, whether it's toys or food or whatever it might be. Um, and so one of the things that we, we took advantage of uh, was actually the, the, the project that they would work on was a project in which they would need to go to the market and they would need to buy a, a certain product that they could test. So this was actually for their science class uh, in, in grade seven. They would do a science experiment where they would test a certain product. So for example, they would test the quality of batteries or they would test the quality of uh, uh, glass cleaner or soap uh, or, or test the strength of, uh, of the, the masking tape, right? <laughs> or whatever or whatever it might be, the permanence of the, the pencil pen. And they would go to the market and they would buy several brands of whatever product would be. And then they would design uh, an experiment uh, to be had there back in the classroom and back in the dorm rooms. Um, so again, uh, it's it's a an old-fashioned science project, no science experiment, but they have to use their Chinese language to purchase the product uh, or to acquire the product. Um, they have to uh, find the different brands, um, and then they had to conduct the testing. No, um, so uh, this is uh, you know some of the experiences there in in Fujian province. In two thousand eight, we established a program for uh, for our uh, grade twelve students, and this was in Beijing, um, and so. They had a chance to uh, see things like the Great Wall, uh, but also to really consider um, more than just the culture, but also eco economics and politics. So in the upper right hand corner, you have um, what's called the, the, the Beijing Urban Planning Exhibition Hall. Uh, and this is a layout of the city of Beijing. Uh, and this was uh, this uh, particular uh, picture was taken uh, just just after the Olympics. But the exhibit had been put up in 2002. And so what Beijing was saying to its uh, citizens was as early as 2000 or 2002, this is the future. This is what we will build. And they did. And so you can go to the, you know, go to the museum and see how they laid out a plan of development. And so for our, many of our students, it had them thinking, ah, can we have some kind of urban planning for the Philippines? How do we do that? Right. Um, how can we think about that? Um, in the lower left hand, um, they had an opportunity to visit a Chinese medicine factory that was run by a Chinese Filipino also. And so they understand what's it like doing business in China. Um, and in fact, that particular factory also that uh, the owner, his name is Richard Alianan. He also talked to them about how do we protect the environment, even if we are a factory, right? How do we uh, share ethical business practices in our hiring of, of Chinese workers? No? So there's an engagement with the real world. Um, and in the, in the bottom right, uh, we have our students uh, having a cultural exchange uh, with Chinese university students. And these are Chinese university students at uh, Renmin, uh, Renmin Dasue, that's uh, the People's University. And uh, they are Filipino 
studies majors. So these are Chinese university students who want to major in Philippine studies and they're learning Tagalog and they're learning Philippine literature and they're learning about Philippine history and they're having a, a cultural exchange. No. Um, so those were the types of experiences that we wanted to have um, in, in all of our programs. And then finally, we started a program for our grade 10 students in Southwest China. So if the, the, the first program now in grade eight uh, was about cultural identity, identity, right? Learning and going back to your roots. And the, the Beijing program was about business and was about politics. Um, this grade 10 program was about environment and was about culture. Um, Yunnan province is one of the most diverse uh, provinces in all of China. Uh, and uh, there are uh, some 28 different ethnic groups that live in Yunnan province and, and varied uh, landscapes. And so the students would, would look at, uh, you know, do uh, some eco ecological studies of, of some of the places they would visit, right? Um, and also learn some of the different cultures uh, that, that could be experienced in Yunnan province. So those, those were very uh, rich experiences. But along the way, Savior School was also uh, providing a number of other international interactions. Um, so these were short uh, or, or, or min, you know, not, not quite as developed. Um, Singapore, so for about uh, five days, our students would, would look at entrepreneurship in Singapore. There were some students who would go to Canada for, for three weeks to, to learn about culture there. Um, we would host students from Chile and from France. So these were students who would come and stay with Savior families for two months at the time, uh, which cost the school nothing, right? Uh, we made an organization, we made a partnership with an organization called AFS, and they would place those students at Savior School. Um, and neither our students or our school would have to pay very much at all to have this uh, cultural interaction right there at the school. Uh, similarly, we had students from another Jesuit school in Australia, St. Aloysius from Sydney, Australia, visit. And that's the picture you see uh, in, the, in the upper right. Um, and then finally, another thing that cost nothing was uh, the face-to-face -face video conferences. Um, and the video conferences like this one, where people can be connected from around the world uh, at no cost. Uh, and, and so that was something that we were uh, hoping to achieve uh, as well. Uh, one of another highlight was leaning into our network of Jesuit schools. Um, and there are Jesuit schools in Japan, Indonesia, Hong Kong, Australia. And they came together uh, in the Philippines. And we would host uh, a one week long service leadership program uh, in which the students would go through immersion programs together, um, go through uh, a retreat together. And they would uh, recollection, they would reflect, they would think, they would discuss, um, and they would also think about how they, as young people, can impact the world um, and how they would want to, to continue impacting the world in a collaborative way uh, with, a, with a global sense of partnership. Yeah. And then finally, the other thing that Save Your School was doing um, to promote a sense of global citizenship was to directly address its academic program. Um, and so part of that was through international benchmarking examinations. Um, so we have uh, Save Your School is a K to 12 school. Um, so we would have our grade seven students take um, the uh, Singaporean uh, international version of the primary school leaving exam. So in other words, comparing uh, Savior grade seven students to Singapore grade seven students. How do we compare in math uh, and in English, right? Um, how, do we, uh, uh, how do we compare, um, you know, our Chinese language learning ability using something like the HSK, right? Um, how do you uh, compare, uh, let's say, uh, the learning compared to, say, um, American students using the, um, the pre-SAT, uh, uh, the Scholastic Aptitude Test that uh, American universities use for college admissions? So there was some testing that we would see. Can we compare ourselves to global standards? Um, and then in 2010, Savior School adopted the International Baccalaureate Diploma Program, uh, which focuses on international mindedness. Um, it's a senior high school curriculum. Um, the classes, uh, students take the classes for two years. Um, they uh, have six class, six core classes that they will take in, in uh, literature, um, in history, or in the social sciences, in math, in the arts, in science, and in another language. Um, so whether that's Chinese, uh, uh, or they could also take a second literature cl class. So you could take uh, English literature and also Filipino literature. No. Um, this also provided professional development that connected our teachers uh, to, uh, to other, uh, other uh, professionals around the world as well.
right? Um, so um, there were lots of opportunities with the International Baccalaureate Diploma Program. But one of the most interesting things was, okay, the IB focuses on international mindedness. And the question was, what does that look like for a student? You know, what are the skills that we're trying to, that we are trying to really develop, right? Um, so I see in the chat there that uh, uh, Manolita mentions that we have to think about the goals of internationalization, not just the input, no? And so one of the goals that the IB articulates are these traits, right? Uh, and uh, more than just the words, they, they spell out the skills later. So you can go to IBO.org, the International Baccalaureate Organization, and learn more about what they, what they call their learner profile. But for them, uh, an internationally minded thinker and learner is one who has all of these traits. Um, that is communicators, uh, you know, can communicate in multiple languages. Um, that is open-minded to different cultures and to different ideas. Um, that uh, can think through uh, different, uh, you know, different perspectives and be reflective about their own culture and their own ideas. Someone who's willing to take a risk to go out of his or her comfort zone in order to learn more about the world. Someone who's inquiring about the world around them. So uh, what was helpful with the International Baccalaureate uh, framework is they're not just saying, okay, you should read international things or global things, or you should go to different parts of the world, but there are traits and attributes that we want to develop in the learner. You know? um, the other piece about uh, the International Baccalaureate uh, curriculum here is this idea of uh, an integrated approach to learning. And in the International Baccalaureate Diploma Program, this happens in three components called, um, first of all, theory of knowledge. So there is a course. Uh, it's not as intensive as the science or English or math course. It might only meet, um, let's say, once or twice per week. But it's a course that invites students to think about the connections they're making between their various subjects. So rather than learning science in isolation and history in isolation, math in isolation, the theory, theory of knowledge course would ask students to say, in what ways is learning in science similar to learning in history? And in what ways, what ways is it different, right? Uh, what counts as good evidence in history? What counts as good evidence in science, right? Um, how does culture influence the way we gain knowledge? How does culture influence the way we communicate knowledge? How does culture influence the way that we understand history, the way that we understand literature? So the theory of knowledge course asks them to step back out of their learning and consider the way that other perspectives, the way that other ideas, the way that other disciplines interact with each other to generate learning. You know? um, uh, the extended essay. Uh, this is uh, just a, a research paper, essentially, that students um, gives them a sense of choice and voice as to, uh, to learning as to what they want to learn. Um, they, they spend two years uh, researching and writing on a topic of their choice. Uh, and then most importantly to, or yeah, very important also to this idea of global perspective and citizenship was uh, the creative creativity, action, and service component, which uh, asked and invited students to engage in service activities, to engage in extracurricular activities, co-curricular activities, and to reflect what am I learning not only in the classroom, what am I learning in my sports? What am I learning when I do service? What am I learning at my church? What am I learning in my uh, in my piano lessons, right? Or whatever it might be that I'm doing other than uh, studies. And how do I become a reflective learner in all of those ways as well? No? Okay. Um, we'll pause very briefly. And I, I, I'd uh, invite once again. At Savior, there was a, an articulated desire to develop international mindedness. That's why all of these uh, initiatives were taken upon. Um, I'm curious, in what ways is global citizenship or international mindedness an explicitly, explicitly stated aim of your school, of your context? Right? Is that something your school discusses? Uh, and, and regardless of the activities, is it something that uh, administrators and educators say, yes, this is something we want to develop. Yes, we will have this in our vision and our mission in our in our school documents. Um, and if so, or whether or not that's the case, 
Um, have your students participated in, in global activities such as video conferences like this or intercultural exchanges or an international curriculum? Um, I'm curious to see um, uh, if, if others might have uh, similar experiences um, that would they would be willing to share. You know? Okay, and I know there's a, there's a bit of a lag, so please uh, continue the conversation in the chat, uh, but uh, reflecting on your own experience there uh, about whether your school and whether your context um, explicitly discusses uh, global citizenship um, or, or uh, international mindedness, and if your students have participated in, in such activities. Okay, um, so again, th there was a comment earlier about, okay, we have these inputs, we have these activities, what are the outcomes and what are the effects? And that was my question as well. Uh, and so as I uh, continued my studies at the, uh, Ateneo de Manila, my master's degree there, I began to think, how would we measure this? How would we measure global citizenship? How would we measure global mindedness or global perspective? Uh, and, and first of all, anyway, what are we talking about, right? What, what, what construct or what idea exactly are we speaking of? Um, in fact, some researchers who, who were commissioned by the International Baccalaureate, Singh and Chi in 2013, uh, found at least, in fact, there's, there's 12 different uh, concepts that they found related to these ideas. Um, five have the most uh, academic uh, research and, and, and literature around them. Global citizenship, you know, this idea that, that students um, should learn to be an active participant um, that all people around the world have duties and responsibilities to everyone else around the world. Um, and how do we learn about, for example, the UN uh, Declaration of Human Rights? That, 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 that's the concept of global citizenship. Yeah. Global mindedness. Global mindedness would be um, not just uh, my, the duties and responsibilities, but how often am I thinking about the way in which my life is interconnected with those around me? Um, so obviously we could turn on the TV and see, oh, okay, I, I see CNN right uh, on TV or I, I see NBA, right? So there's a connection there. Um, but do I see the way that the products that I use may have been produced in Indonesia or in India or in Bangladesh or in China, right? Or the, or the products that we have in the Philippines are being produced um, and, and sold uh, somewhere else. No. Um, international mindedness. So this shift from global to international. International meaning, how do I think about the relationships between nation states? So global mindedness, broadly speaking, how are, are humans connected around the world? International mindedness, how do I see the, the, the international politics playing out uh, among these different countries? And am I aware? of international politics and international relations. Intercultural understanding. Okay, so another phrase. Uh, how do I uh, develop skills to encounter other peoples? Uh, intercultural understanding can happen even within the same nation. No? So how can uh, uh, people within the Philippines of different languages and cultures uh, understand each other, right? How can um, people in China of different ethnic ethnicities and cultures understand each other or here in the United States? Different Americans of different races and different backgrounds understand each other. That's intercultural understanding. And then finally, global perspective, uh, which I'll, I'll spend some more time talking about, uh, which is a way not only of thinking, but also of feeling and also of behaving. You know? um, and so that was the, uh, it was this last one, global perspective that I, I chose to, to focus on in my research for a few reasons. Number one, it's based off of uh, a broader understanding of learning and of student development that says that learning does not only happen uh, cog uh, cognitively in our minds, it also happens affectively <clears throat> in our emotions and then behaviorally in what we do. You know? um, and so there are three dimensions to global perspective. Um, the cognitive, what we think, the intrapersonal, what we feel uh, inside of ourselves, and interpersonal, how we interact with each other. And that's mapped against thinking, feeling, and doing. Cognitive, intra, and interpersonal. No? Um, uh, the instrument uh, that uh, Larry Brasscamp uh, developed was called the Global Perspective Inventory. Um, and uh, at, at some point, I, I can um, go back and, and find the link for that. Uh, and I, I share that with uh, Franco maybe towards the end of this. Um, but it's readily available and has been used in a number of other studies. No? So... A little bit about the global perspective uh, by Larry uh, Brasscamp. The cognitive dimension, what we think, 
has two subdivisions. What we know, so uh, knowing rather that, that our culture is different from other cultures. No, and knowing and understanding that my culture might give me a certain bias to how I see the world. No, um, uh, knowledge is an understanding of various cultures. So what knowledge do I have of Chinese culture, of Filipino culture, of American culture? No. The intrapersonal dimension is identity. How do I feel about my own culture? Right? Do I, do I spend time thinking and, and appreciating my own culture? And then affect, uh, how do I view other cultures? Am I open to other cultures? Am I dismissive of other cultures? Do I have some type of prejudice or even hate towards other cultures? Um, am I aware of that? That's the intrapersonal dimension. And then the interpersonal dimension is social responsibility. Um, so do I engage in activities for social impact, right? Do I, you know, share uh, on, on Facebook, right? On my social media, do I share about, you know, what's happening in Ukraine, right? Um, do I um, volunteer for organizations that have global impact, right? And then social interactions. To what extent do I willingly go out of my comfort zone and interact with people who are not like me? They're not like me either because of language or maybe just more simply because of gender or because of age uh, or because of sexual orientation. How willing am I to interact with others uh, different from myself? No. So those are the three dimensions. Okay. Uh, and I would ask, as I did my research here, which of the following do you think had the biggest impact on global perspective of Savior students? So please type your type your answer into the chat, A, B, C, or D. Type your answer into the chat, A, B, C, or D. Um, we have, uh, again, I, I looked and, and fielded the global perspective inventory um, to about uh, 700 Savior students. Some of them had been on the Savior China experience. Some had not. Um, some were part of the International Baccalaureate program. Some were not. Some had interacted with students uh, from Chile or France. Others had not. Um, some uh, were deeply involved in extracurricular activities, uh, and some were not. So I just invite you to type your answer into the chat. What do you think? Which of the following had the biggest impact on global perspective? Was it A, study abroad experiences, B, international curriculum, C, international exchanges, or D, co-curricular involvement? So we're seeing a little bit of everything. We have one person with D, one with B, one with A. We have a few people with C here. Okay, so some uh, some answers uh, coming in now. Uh, C and B, and maybe uh, just a few more seconds. No, uh, yeah, it's 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 interesting to see, right? Um, uh, which ones, uh, which one might have had the the biggest impact? Of course, all combined would have some form of impact, as Mark Gray Mabuhay has said. No, that all four would have some impact. However, one did have more impact than the others. No. So let's go through these one by one. Study abroad, spending six weeks in China was associated with just one subscale of one dimension. That was the intrapersonal dimension. So in terms of this particular instrument, the Global Perspective Inventory, studying abroad was able to enhance one's appreciation for one's own culture. No. And we found that many times. The Savior students who'd go to China and say, oh, wow, they have these beautiful buildings. Yes, they have these uh, quick development. But I am so proud to be Filipino. I'm proud of my culture. I'm proud of, even if I'm Chinese Filipino, I'm more proud to be Filipino, actually, <laughs> than to be Chinese. Uh, so very interesting. It, it really developed an appreciation for culture, right? So it was helpful. Study abroad was helpful. The international curriculum was very helpful with the cognitive dimension especially with something like that theory of knowledge course. No? Uh, the cognitive dimension invites the learner to say, uh, what, am I, what are my biases, right? And what do I know about the world? Well, an international cur curriculum was, was very helpful in, in uh, producing that sense of global perspective. The international exchanges. Well, of course, if you are directly interacting with another person, uh, then, uh, then that interpersonal dimension should be, uh, should be increased. And in that interaction with another person, you have perhaps also a, a greater appreciation for your own culture. So 
uh, international exchanges was associated with both the interpersonal and intrapersonal dimensions. But nothing was as effective as service activities and leadership activities, right? Uh, so the good news and what I, I, what I hope is the one takeaway really from all of these things is that of all the things that a school can do, the most impactful on global perspective is probably the thing that most schools are already doing, providing direct opportunities for students to interact with people who are not like them, to serve a greater cause, to contribute to something that's wider than themselves, right? And to have opportunities that take them out of their comfort zone on a regular basis. So when you think about it, what impacts someone more? Being in one place for six weeks or being involved in a club where they have to dedicate their time, and their talent and their effort day after day, year after year for four years, seven years, you know, two years of senior high school or, or, or six years of high school. Um, it's that, it's that progressive cumulative effect of those daily experiences of being brought out of your comfort zone that have the biggest effect on global perspective, right? Uh, global perspective is, is uh, then for all three, right? Um, uh, it, it is developed, right, through, through those everyday activities. So some recommendations that I came from my research is, yes, the schools can build on service and leadership experiences with opportunities for reflection. So it's not just the experience that matters. It's the, it's the meaning that people will make as a result of the experience. Do we provide opportunities after the club activity, after the sports event for students to stop and reflect? What did I learn? Where was I uncomfortable? What was I uncomfortable? What were my mindsets or maybe my stereotypes that I had coming into the experience that have now changed because of that? That opportunity for reflection allows really uh, for um, for greater sense of global perspective. Um, curriculum can emphasize an awareness of cultural perspectives, right? So if we're teaching a, a particular um, um, lesson in history, we might ask ourselves, okay, but how would this be viewed from this other perspective, right? I was very surprised when I moved back to the, the, the US uh, and I, I happened to visit a history class. And in the history class, uh, they were discussing uh, American colonialism in the Philippines of all places. And what the activity was is they were going to do a debate. And of course, this is United States. So they were uh, pretending to be uh, different uh, representatives in the, in the US House of Representatives. And they were pretending that the the the, the age was uh, you know 1910 or 1912, uh, and um, so uh, you know they, they there's this uh, Philippine uh, American protectorate right of the Philippines, and the House of Representatives is going to debate uh, what exactly should America do with the Philippines, um, but the twist was everyone in the classroom was given a different role, right? So some were given the role of the the U.S. president. Some were given the role of a, an American soldier. Some were given the role of a Philippine soldier. Some were given the role of, uh, um, you know, someone uh, who had not had access at all, who under Spanish colonization was not even educated, but, you know, a, a farmer, right, in, in, uh, in, uh, in the Philippines. Um, and in fact, those students were then given primary source documents in some cases written by various people. So they were given a, a document written by the president of the, of the United States at that time. Right, or they were given a document uh, written by a, a Filipino scholar, right, at the time, and they used that document to try to take that perspective, and they were then having a debate in class to say, okay, uh, from my perspective, I, I'm going to take on the perspective of uh, a Filipino politician, and uh, and I want my own independence, and so here I am in this classroom, and I'm hearing American students adopting the perspective of, or trying at least to adopt the perspective of the Filipinos to say. Oh, we want our own country. We want independence, right? Uh, and then adopt the perspective of some Americans who are saying, "Oh, we should colonize that that country," and then the perspective of other Americans who are saying, "No, we stand for we stand for uh, you know sovereignty. We should give the Filipinos their own their own country." And so, rather than the teacher simply saying, "Okay, the Philippines, uh, you know, uh, the United States uh, had this influence in the Philippines," next page in history the students were adopting these different perspectives. And that's something that's possible really in any classroom. Um, Co-curricular activities and exposure should focus on a meaningful and su sustained social interaction. You know? um, so if there are opportunities to travel to another part of the country or to travel to another part of the world, 
Um, it, that's the difference between a, a tourism and, and really global perspective changing is are you interacting? Are you having conversations with people? Or are you simply taking, seeing sites and taking pictures? No. Um, and then finally, uh, schools that want to use some of these international initiatives, um, again, it was well said earlier, let's think about the learning rather than just the input. No. So here are some pedagogical practices, right? For those three dimensions of global perspective uh, inventory, the cognitive, the intrapersonal, and the interpersonal. Um, cognitive, those perspective taking activities, right? Uh, that I mentioned, the class debates, those class conversations, having students adopt different perspectives, right? Um, global content, uh, that, that, that's maybe the more obvious one. No? Do we teach about what's happening in other parts of the world? Do we teach not only our own history, but the history of, uh, of India, the history of uh, other countries in Southeast Asia, right? Um, uh, countries in Africa, countries in South America, right? Um, do we teach about well, you know what's happening with Russia and and, and why where why uh, we you know we should understand what's uh, uh, un, what's being experienced by those in Ukraine. You know? Media literacy, you know, do we think about the sources of information, right? And and really question where our information is coming from, the perspectives that the information may have hidden behind um, the medium that it's coming in. You know, do we do we ask students to look for bias in in not only in in the Facebook posts that they see or the Twitter or the Instagram posts they see, uh, but even on what they hear in the radio or in the news uh, news uh, stories. Um, some pedagogical practices for the intrapersonal dimension. I mentioned that focus on on the habit of reflection, uh, but also I I know that this group has had a previous engagement with social emotional learning, uh, and that's a powerful way of understanding my own culture my own perspectives and understanding that other people may see things differently. Um, opportunities for celebrating culture, celebrating different uh, regional identities, right? That's important for interpersonal um, uh, perspective. And then finally, the interpersonal. Yeah, well, of course, not everyone can travel, uh, especially with <laughs> under what's happening with COVID, but these co video conferences make things possible. And are there opportunities to connect students, right? So um, I was very happy that some of my students here at Loyola uh, over the past uh, two years, we're able to have video conferences with students at Savior School. No. Uh, and, and that educators uh, from around the world, some of my teachers, my co-teachers at Loyola, were also able to interact uh, with, um, with other uh, teachers around the world. No. So there's a, a time difference, but if you're willing to live with a time difference, there's opportunities for connection there. Um, obviously, we have field trips or immersions, as, as we heard, um, and guest speakers bringing other people into the classroom. No. Um, okay. Um, so just your context a little bit there as well. Which of the activities do you, uh, of these activities, do you do well in your school? Uh, and which of these activities would you like to implement? So I'd be curious to hear from, from all of you as well. Um, many of these things you're already doing, right? So opportunities for celebration. Um, there may be many, many ways in which you are already promoting a sense of global citizenship through your current pedagogical practice um, that would be worth sharing and worth celebrating. Um, so please take some time to put into the chat you know, those, uh, those different strategies that you see happening in your school. Uh, maybe there are some interesting class debates that are happening in the school. Maybe there's even um, a speech and debate club. Uh, uh, maybe uh, there are individuals uh, who are involved in, in a cultural club, uh, for example, um, uh, or that engage in some of these video conferences. Right. So if you see some of these practices in your school, please feel free to share them now in the chat. Okay. Uh, I hope we, we can learn from each other as well. So please feel free to share those um, as, as, we, as we discuss um, and as we move into the final portion uh, of this webinar. This final portion is about diversity, equity, and inclusion. So in 2015, I moved back here to the United, United States. Um, and uh, learned a lot more about the, 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 the theoretical frameworks around uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? Um, so the United States uh, is, an, uh, is, uh, is a very particular context, you no? Know, uh, where for hundreds of years, you had, had an entire group of people, of African Americans, of Black Americans, uh, who were enslaved, right? From the 1400s, certainly, you know, in, in a major way in the 1500s, um, right through uh, the, the, the Civil War, officially, so 1800s. So 300 years, not just of colonization, but of, of slavery, 
um, of, of being forced by threat of violence and death um, to serve another race. You know? um, and uh, this is quite ironic uh, for a country that uh, proclaimed in its constitution the freedom and liberty and um, being able to be independent from tyranny. You know? um, so for the last 150 years of, of American history, uh, Americans have really been struggling with how do we uh, reconcile this terrible event of slavery and the lasting effects, not just of slavery, but of discrimination, of legal discrimination for another 100 years after slavery. Black Americans, largely speaking, were not allowed to vote. They were not allowed, in many cases, to own property, to start businesses. Um, they had to learn in separate schools. Um, so uh, for 400 years, uh, Black Americans were oppressed, subjugated, not to mention that uh, the Native Americans, Indigenous Americans were moved from their land. Um, and so there, there is uh, a good amount of, uh, of, uh, of challenge, historical um, tension um, and uh, historical uh, problems, uh, historical oppression of peoples in the United States. You know? um, and as far as the United States has come to remove many of those barriers, um, the legacy of many of these things exists. So in the United States now, not only do we have the challenge of intercultural communication and intercultural understanding, um, we now also have the challenge of how do we understand different cultures when one culture has been actively oppressed by another for several hundred years, right? Um, and even if the, the, the rules and some of the laws are much more even now, how do we deal with the continued, um, continued discrimination um, and continued um, effects um, of, of that kind of damage. No. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about some of this terminology, which uh, I understand, I think in the next, uh, in, in one of the future sessions, you will hear more about this, right? Um, so diversity, this commitment to really understanding a wide variety of, uh, of perspectives, right? That's what's meant by diversity. Um, equity is to say, we want equal opportunity. So not only do we want to say, okay, that we want Asian people and Black people and Latino people to be able to participate alongside white people, um, we want them to have equal opportunities. But what does equal opportunity look like when one group has been historically oppressed, right? We could say, oh, we have equal opportunity in a school. But if historically you have prohibited Black people from studying in the same schools as white schools, then you can change the law overnight and there's going to be inequality as you move forward. No. So how do you balance out, how do you address that inequality, right? Um, given that, okay, it's equal opportunity now, but for hundreds of years, some of these groups were not, were not equal. And so they st are still at a disadvantage. So how can you balance that out? That, th those are questions of, of equity. Uh, th those are difficult questions, not, not easy questions. No. Um, and then inclusion. Okay. We, we might be able to give opportunities to, to students who've been marginalized or oppressed, give them opportunities to participate, right? But do they have a say also in decision-making, right? So sometimes you'll, you'll, you'll hear a comparison, okay? Um, diversity is inviting many different people to the dance. Equity is making sure everyone at the at, who's at the party has an opportunity to dance, is asked to dance. <laughs> and then... Inclusion is, does everyone have an opportunity to contribute to the playlist so they can dance to a song that they also know? <laughs> so invited to the party, that's diversity, right? Um, being asked to dance, that's equity, right? Uh, being able to contribute, uh, to be included in, 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 uh, to, the, to the playlist of the song, that's, uh, yeah, that's inclusion. No. Um, so uh, that's, that's some of the, the terminology that I'll be uh, using for this last portion. At Loyola, we then said, okay, we were, we're committed here to uh, diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, Loyola now, I'm very happy to say, um, is much more diverse than it was when I was uh, a student there 25 uh, years ago. Um, it's about twice as diverse, at least 20% students of color. In fact, our incoming um, ninth grade class is, is about 30% students, uh, non-white students. No? So we're being finally able to reflect the actual diversity of the United States um, in our school. But uh, to, to what, what we've addressed earlier in this uh, talk is we want to really focus on what are we training our students to do? What are we educating them to do? Not simply to be around other people, 
not simply to have other people of diverse perspectives, but we want to train certain ideas so that even if the school were 100% white or 100% Filipino or 100% whatever it might be, that we would still be training skills that would be preparing them for the future. And we use the understanding by design framework, uh, which says that you should think about the long-term transfer uh, of the skills that you're giving, right? So rather than simply saying, okay, I want to teach the skill of, um, you know, of, of how to use, um, you know, uh, how to use uh, PowerPoint or how to use Excel, I want to begin thinking about, okay, in an age when PowerPoint and Excel might not even be present, what are the long-term transfers, the skills that would transfer into other situations and into other times and contexts? And so inspired by the global perspective inventory, we divided our transfer skills, our transfer goals into a cognitive, affective, and behavioral dimension, right? Um, so these are our DEI and global mindedness um, transfer goals, okay? The first one, thinking. We want our students to, to understand and articulate how the wide diversity of human experience reveals and enriches our common humanity. So yes, we are different. Yes, we should learn about these different ideas. Yes, we should be open to other perspectives. However, the more we dig into the diversity of human experience, the more we can see clearly what's really common. You know? The more I can learn about the experiences of colonization and oppression in the United States, the more I can see, oh gosh, there's some parallels and connections between the experience that also Filipinos had in the Philippines with Americans, right? I can see common experiences the more that I also see diverse experiences. The affective transfer goal. Students will feel confident and proud of who they are, even while being open and respectful in the face of human difference. You know, that's, that's the... I want to feel proud of who I am, but I also want to be appreciative of other people, right? Uh, again, going back to that affective dimension of uh, the global perspective in inventory. And then finally, we want our students to take the initiative to engage in dialogue with people from a wide variety of backgrounds. There's a, 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 an addition here to what we saw with the interpersonal dimension of the global perspective inventory. And that is, we want students to take the initiative. Okay, so I, as an educator, I can set up a video conference, sure. I can invite a guest speaker who speaks a different language into the classroom, sure. But how often will my students take that initiative? And that's what I really want. After they graduate from Loyola, I, I don't want them simply to be able to, to tolerate a person who's very different being in their presence. I want them to actively seek it out, right? And so that that, that adds an additional challenge. How do, how, how do we do that? How do we do that? No. Um, so, uh, obviously, some of those initiatives will look similar to what uh, we've done in the past, right? So, as it turns out, I also had an opportunity to bring students from the United States to China, right? Um, but really, almost all that we've done at Loyola has not been that kind of intercultural exchange or that study abroad or that immersion. Um, it's been a lot of work in the classroom, in our school building. So, we put together a diversity in the curriculum committee, which I'll talk about in a moment. It's a professional learning community of, of educators where we think about how we can make our curriculum more global-minded, more inclusive. Um, that committee also uh, is in charge of putting together a curriculum audit. How do we think about our curriculum? How do we systematically examine our curriculum so that we are looking for different voices? Um, we also have intercultural experiences, as I mentioned uh, previously. And then we want to begin thinking about the cultural competencies that we can teach our students. How can we teach them that culture influences thought and behavior, right? Something like the theory of knowledge class or a philosophy class can help with this. How do we help them identify and address bias? And there are some skills there uh, that can be developed, right? So when students say something that is sexist or homophobic, how do we teach them to stop each other to say, sorry, I don't like you saying that? Or, you know, maybe for a more American uh, way of saying things, hey man, that's messed up. You shouldn't say that, right? Um, how do we teach them to stand up for it? Because uh, they won't say those kinds of things with a teacher available, with a teacher there. They say it when the teacher is gone. And so how do we train our students to stand up for others, even in the absence of, of those you know, officials? Um, how do we teach students to learn, uh, to listen with respect, listen with the intent to understand? 
rather than always trying to answer, always trying to debate back, simply saying, oh, that's different. Can you explain more? Right? How do we teach them those listening skills? Right? Um, those are all pieces that we are that we are trying to develop more and more uh, at, at, at here at Loyola. Yeah. So let me talk a little bit about this diversity in the curriculum committee. It's composed was first of all initiated by teachers, not by administrators. Right. Um, uh, so uh, teachers saying we want this to happen. OK, so the teachers from the committee. Uh, I was assistant principal at the time. I said, oh, I'm happy to bring us together, happy to help facilitate. Uh, but it's the teachers who took the lead. No. All of these teachers wanted to learn more about diversity, equity, inclusion. Uh, and so we sent them to professional development activities, to webinars, um, uh, allowed them to purchase books about this, um, allowed them to attend conferences online or in person about diversity, equity, inclusion. Right. Um, so one of uh, the, the, the events that we have uh, participated in, and for the last two years it has been virtual, is something called the People of Color Conference. P-O-C-C, People of Color Conference, um, to talk about DEI issues. Um, this committee uh, meets and it allows for a collaboration. So for teachers from different departments to support each other, right? And also to hold each other accountable. Um, it's a multicultural group. Um, so in the group, we have uh, Latina, we have Black, we have Asian, we have white voices just within this uh, uh, committee group. Um, and more powerfully, we have Representative, rep, 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 representatives from different departments, from the English department, from math department, from science department. Um, and so when we speak, we can hear, oh, this is what our department's doing. And I think about that as being a cross pollinator, right? So it's like the the the, the bee that, that goes from flower to flower, pollinating many different uh, flowers, right? Um, this, the, the committee comes together um, and we can share ideas and make uh, make each other's departments uh, richer because of that. So what are we doing? One of the things uh, that I mentioned was a diversity audit. No, uh, and we wanted to have a way in which the diversity of, of uh, diversity in the curriculum committee, uh, I'll, I'll call it DCC, <laughs> uh, how the DCC could help each department reflect. Because just as an example, not all members of the history department are very curious about DEI. They're open to it, but they don't have the same level of expertise as this committee. Um, so how could we talk to all the history department and guide them in a conversation that would help them see also their own biases, right? Um, this is a delicate situation because essentially what we might be saying is, oh, you know, you might have some prejudice in the way that you're teaching. And of course that could be threatening to teachers, right? So we wanted to be very careful about how we do this, right? Um, and the way that we did this was to really think about how do we help teachers reflect on their own experience? In other words, we're not going to tell the teachers what they're doing wrong. We want to have a process of reflection. So yeah, we're back to that concept of reflection, right? Um, and so what we did is we give, gave these questions to the department ahead of time. And then we arranged a meeting. So members of the diversity in the curriculum committee, members of the DCC, sat with the English department and with the history department and the religious department. And we asked these questions. What are the narratives that are in the curriculum? What are the stories? OK, so we hear the story of Abraham Lincoln. And we hear the story of Martin Luther King. But do we hear the story of Native Americans who were oppressed? Do we hear the story of women in America who before 1918 were not able to vote? Do we hear the story in America of Filipinos, right? Uh, do we hear the story of Japanese who were placed in internment camps, you know, in the United States during World War II, um, simply for being Japanese, right? They were arrested and put in prison. Do we hear those perspectives, right? And then the other question, and this was a difficult question. When you look at all the stories that are told, what is the larger story being told? So earlier in the chat, someone said that, uh, you know, the Philippines is very similar to U.S. culture, Manolita, that's you again, that, that you know, somehow sometimes we, we view Americans as superior. And in America, it's not just Americans, it's, it's white Americans. So do we paint a picture accident? Maybe it's accidental, right? Do we accidentally paint a picture of white America being superior, right? So when I, we look at the, the textbook or the novels that are being read in English and all of the heroes of the English novels are, are white. Are we accidentally sending a, a signal 
that being white is better, right? Are we accidentally sending that signal? And, and we engage in its reflection. So the DCC is not coming into the English department saying, you need to stop teaching this, look at your curriculum. We ask a question and an honest question in a safe space and the English teachers themselves would say, oh, you know what? We do not feature any works by an Asian American author. I wonder how that makes our Asian American students feel. You know? And based off of that, then, then the department would decide what to do more, you know? what to do more. Um, what perspectives are, are absent uh, or, or underrepresented, you see those questions. No? Um, so this is what that looked like, uh, the second step. Okay, we asked those questions. Well, now we've specified some of those goals. Where are you already doing that in your curriculum? And, and what activities and assessments do you have to do that? And if you don't, or if you're not already doing that, what would you like to do? What are some of your ideas? And I'd be happy to share these slides and, and share these worksheets uh, uh, with, uh, with Franco and share these with the group as well, right? Um, so this was a systematic way, really, of, of working through the curriculum. Let's look at the goals that we want students to have and then see the, the opportunities for instruction and for assessment. No, that was for cognitive goals, for affective goals, right? So how can we give students an opportunity to acknowledge various aspects of their identity. Where do we assess that they express appreciation for their identity? No. And then behavioral. What do we do to allow them to interact? No. That's a few more, There's two or three more minutes and I will be finished here. No. Okay, um, here we are. The last step, let's look at various levels of the curriculum. Let's look not only at the, the lessons we're teaching, let's also look, do our textbooks reflect different perspectives? Do we have a history textbook that's only written by one American author? Does he reflect or she reflect the other perspectives in that textbook as well? When I show images, the, the, the pictures on my PowerPoint slide, are they only of white Americans or do I show images of other people? When I play music during the school assembly, is it international music? Is it from a wide diversity or is it only one type of pop music? No. Um, in terms of assessment, do I give opportunities for students to express themselves in different ways? The teacher preparedness, how do we prepare teachers for this as well? What training do they need? Huh? It's not easy to do that. Okay. So I'll, I'll hold this question uh, for context um, towards the end. Uh, because I just have some final thoughts here. I invite you to continue your own professional uh, journey, development journey, uh, as you think about DEI and international mindedness. Uh, I encourage you, uh, after these kinds of webinars, to spend some time to pause and reflect. To think about the long-term skills and mindsets that you want your students to have, not just the activities that we have, and then finally, to celebrate, celebrate the good work you're already doing, right? Sometimes when people think about global mindedness, they say, ah, we don't have any international trips. Well, that's not, that's not yet global mindedness. No? Global mindedness is what you can do every day in the classroom. And you're already doing much of that work. And it's important to acknowledge that, to celebrate that, and to share that. So thank you so much. I'd be happy to to take any questions that we might have at this time. Yes, thank you so much, um, Sir Brian, for that uh, for that discussion on uh, global education. No? Uh, and of course, I can relate so much because of the stories you've told no, uh, on the earlier part of the discussion. Um, just to share, no, as I've shared in the chat already. No, I was uh, under uh, Sir Brian when I became a supervisor for the Savior China Experience. It was my first ever. Um, uh, exchange program or no? international program. Okay. Anyway, teachers, let's now uh, proceed to uh, uh, our open forum. If you have questions, concerns, or um, insights you'd like to share with uh, with our speaker for today, okay. But uh, Sir Brian, before while we're waiting for questions um, for um, for our teachers uh, from our teachers today, is uh, I have. 
I have a like my own question <laughs> because when we talk yes. about like global education, it's an ever dynamic concept. No, it's all yes. uh, always changing. Yes. Uh, there's really no. It's not like a, like a program that can um, uh, like stay for long because um, uh, in, in the program that we're implementing for global education, uh, it's constantly being challenged by the dynamics of like uh, diversity. Oh. No, so how do we develop a program? Okay. Uh, in such a way that the program lasts longer or are able to um, to really like um, um, promote diversity you know, regardless of the dynamics and changes over time. Yeah, I think that's where the skills, uh, th- those skills are so important, right? Um, and, you know, I think what's difficult right now is uh, the field of global education um, still has a, a little bit of ways to go before there is some more consensus around the world in terms of the skills needed for global perspective. Uh, uh, you know, there's more work, I think, that's being done to, to identify the skills needed uh, for something like diversity, equity, and inclusion. In my mind, personally, the skills for diversity, equity, inclusion are, are the same as global perspective, right? How can I identify bias? How can I learn to listen? How can I learn to willingly interact, right? How can I uh, remember that my perspective influences my thinking, influences my behavior, influences my my feelings, right? Those are the core skills. And I think what can be done in the development of a program is for the school to to articulate. These are the skills we want students to to move away from. And to then articulate where is this already happening and then where is it not happening, right? And what that allows is once you have the transferable skills, uh, the, the transferable skills can be developed in many different ways using many different instructional modalities. No, um, so learning to listen, right? Or you need not go to China, right, <laughs> and, and talk to someone in Chinese in order to to really learn how to listen carefully, right? Or to understand bias, right? Uh, especially now, uh, you know, we can just watch two two or three YouTube videos of people speaking about the same topic from very very different perspectives, passionately debating. And we can say, ah, okay, these, these three people have very different biases, even if they're seeing the same information, even if they're seeing the same data. But if once you've articulated the transfer skills and knowledge that you want the students to take care of, then no matter how the, 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 the school changes and no matter how the world changes, you can change your programs, you can change the, the way you're delivering those skills, but the core identity of global mindedness or the core ideas of uh, of diversity remain the same. Thank you so much for that, no, uh, um, Sir Brian. There's a question from a newly graduated no, um, teacher. Okay, uh, so this is from Teacher Lawrence France uh, Flotil Des. Okay? Uh, global education feels overwhelming for beginning uh, beginning teachers who've just graduated and passed their licensure examination. Yes, indeed, no, it's a it's a very big. Uh, complex no, and dynamic concept. How would novice teachers start practicing um, intercultural awareness or how can they like, uh, like promote uh, intercultural awareness in their own classes? Yeah, I love this question because, uh, you know, I, I mentioned, you know, can we teach about Ukraine and Russia? Uh, and then part of me sometimes as a principal thinking, oh gosh, how do we teach about you know, 200 countries in the world? How do we teach about all these things? Is that even possible? Um, I once heard a talk by a theologian and scientist. Her name is Sister Ilia Delio, uh, I-L-I-A-D-E-L-I-O. And Sister Ilia Delio um, said, let's not worry about the whole world even as we're expanding our sense of global mindedness. And she said, if you expand your consciousness a little bit, that's already one step towards global perspective, global mindedness, right? Um, if you interact with someone in your own town that's a little bit different from you, that's already doing the work of diversity, already doing the, the work of global perspective and global mindedness. So yes, uh, you know we can look at all of this and say, oh gosh, it's a wide world, we can stretch. And in fact, I think that should be an invitation for all of us to say, oh, I should never stop growing. I should never stop learning. There's so much to learn. But at the same time, be gracious with ourselves to say, I don't need to walk up the whole mountain today. I just need to take one step. So in response to that question, that it seems so overwhelming, okay, let's just learn to be a teacher. (laughs) 
Let's learn to listen to our veteran teachers. Let's learn to listen to the students who have different home situations in our classroom, right? And even without engaging someone in a different language or from a different nationality, learning to listen and to understand someone from a different perspective is already a step and towards expanding that that sense of consciousness of global perspective or of diversity. So I think uh, all of us now uh, can really make use of that listening skill, sir, Brian, especially right now with, uh, with the upcoming election and people like throwing um, opinions and their, their mm. own. No, no. Mm. Anyway, uh, this is another question from uh, teacher Manolito White. Okay? Uh, actually, she has two questions. Okay? We'll have the first one. Uh, what are the issues or possible issues that could uh, someone that someone could encounter in global citizenship? Yeah, so I will speak very practically first. I think very often with with educators and administrators, one thing that comes up is uh, uh, <laughs> we we don't have the resources for that. We can't do global citizenship because it's too expensive, right? So that's one issue that often arises. Ah, yung mga study abroad programs na yan, mga exchanges, masyadong mahal yan, can't, can't do that. It's too expensive. Um, but one thing to remember, remember is, oh, it, it's, it's, look, the research would show that even the study abroad program is not the most effective thing you can do. It's effective, sure. But even more effective is, is looking at your curriculum, looking at your pedagogy, looking at the way that you, that, that the learners learn, you know? Um, so that's one way to to address that issue. Another issue is, uh, you know, sometimes there is kind of a curriculum overload, right? Okay, so I have to teach all of that. I have to teach my subjects, but I should also teach about metacognition. I should also teach about 21st century learning. I should also teach about social emotional learning. I should also teach about how to identify uh, students who have learning differences. I should also learn about mental health. What does anxiety look like? What does depression look like? That That's a real issue. That's a real issue. Right, and I, I think that's where administrators and educators have to say, okay, this is important. Global, we, we especially the Philippines, we live very global society, very global country. So rather than thinking about it as something new or additional, how do we build on what we're already doing? How do we how do we maybe enter into this conversation simply by labeling? Uh, okay, this activity we're doing that's already global citizenship, pala. Right, that's that's we can start there. So rather than it thinking like, oh, we have to develop a whole new program, a whole new office, yeah, like Savior School did. No, that's not the case. That's not, and, and depending on the, the perspective of, of a, an individual school, you might say, okay, how do I first simply recognize where global perspective is already happening? Rather than thinking of a new set of initiatives because my brain can only handle so much. Our school can only handle so much. Uh, and then the third issue would be sometimes people think about global citizenship in opposition to nationalism or in opposition to to patriotism and they would say well wait a second we want to be proud filipino citizens right we don't want uh, to be always looking at uh, outside at the rest of the world uh, agreed but what i would say is it's not opposition right uh, that the research would also indicate and our experiences would indicate that when we meaningfully get engage meaningfully engage in other cultures we actually develop a greater pride a greater sense of appreciation for who we are Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think it's it's those three issues. Very often it's cost. People will talk about cost. It's uh, it's mental overload, right? Curricular overload. Uh, and then um, and then it's nationalism or national pride versus globalism. Um, so those are issues I think they can be addressed. But they're uh, but those are the common issues. Thank you, sir. No, actually, the last one that you mentioned will be as was, was supposed to be my question. No? You're like balancing. Uh, your global perspective to your local um, realities no? and as well as local perspective no? and um, and, and it's, that's really doable no sir no there's really that um, uh, sweet spot right there okay uh, this one is from teacher Lord Lena um, global education is a mental development program that seeks to improve global human development how do we ensure that learners have access to quality learning opportunities that that, that, that build relevant skills mm. Yeah, so it's a, it's a it's a wonderful question, and and, and that's a question uh, again of equity, right? Equal opportunity, equal access, right? Um, one of the important ways to 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 address uh, inequalities and to address the ways in which people do not have access is to gather data, right? Um, so um, that that's an important part of what educators need to do is can we see where there are gaps, 
and, and this is important because it's easy to assume where there are gaps. It's easy to say, okay, this school does not have as much as, as much money as this other school. And so therefore they must not be able to build global mindedness in the same way. Oh, be careful, be careful with that. That's not necessarily true, right? So you take something like the global perspective inventory, right? Or other measures, right? Uh, some of which are free <laughs> online. Um, and can we collect data? And before we begin to say, we want to provide this level of uh, instruction or this learning activity, let's get a baseline to, to establish what exactly we're trying to improve no? Um so, for example, as we're thinking about those uh, transfer skills, the cognitive uh, affective behavior skills, for us, we're also trying to think of how will we assess that? How will we know if that's happening? And then we want to use that assessment. We want to use that instrument to gather data to see where there are gaps first. So first step to that is let's gather the data to see what the actual gaps are and where they are. Right. Um, and then second, there is an advocacy piece there. Right. Sometimes as a, as a classroom teacher, we, we're not able to close that gap. But we're able to advocate, we're able to advocate to our leaders, to our school leaders, to our government leaders to say, hey, there's a there's a gap here in opportunity. How can we close that gap? Right. Um, so, yeah. Thank you so much for that, no, Sir uh, Brian. Okay. And maybe this is, will be the last question for uh, tonight. Uh, this again, according from Sir Lord Lena. Okay. Um, since we've talked about earlier core skills about um, 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 being a globally uh, com competent, uh, global competent uh, competencies, okay? so what could be the specific skills of uh, or set of skills, knowledge, and attitudes a student must develop in order to be globally competent? Ano nga ba yung hinahanap ng mundo ngayon uh, to, our, to our students? No? And how, do, how, how should schools and teachers, educators respond in building this um, globally competent individuals. Yeah, I, I'll go briefly back because I know that I rushed through that at the at the very end there. No, um, but um, if I could go back to um, some of these um, to, to some of my slides here, um, it's an important question. No, um, so are we seeing um, my my slides? Yes. Okay. So um, these are some, I'd like to offer these no, as, as particular skills, right? So these are some of the cognitive skills, right? Um, now that first one is not uh, applicable to everybody, no? But that second one, can we identify how various components of identity shape our, our thought, emotion, and behavior, right? So for example, if, if we're talking about a particular issue, right? If we're talking about, uh, okay, uh, there's going to be uh, a, a bill in the Philippines about divorce, Okay, very contentious, right? And a bill about divorce. All right. So, how would would it be possible that men and women see this this uh, differently? Would it be possible that people in Manila and non, not in Manila see it differently? Would it be possible that Muslims and Christians see this differently? Right? Would it be possible? So that second point there, the cognitive goals, that's that's a very important, uh, the, the, the very key and and clear skill. Identify how the components of our identity shape the way that we think about things. Right um, there, bias, stereotyping, systemic injustice, right, related to uh, to identities, right? Okay, so uh, you know some airlines in the Philippines will say you have to be this tall and your complexion should be this color in order for you to be a flight attendant for our airline. Oh, okay, so systemic prejudice, right? Systemic um, uh, bias there. No, um, there, there was also attitudes, no skills and attitudes that you were asking about. So these are some of those uh, the attitudes uh, I think that are that are important would be in that affective side of things. All right. Um, so what are the attitudes? I should be proud of my identity, but I should be. That's number one. Number two, I should be open to others. But number three, not just open. I should appreciate. I should realize. Ah, I'm learning. In fact, I'm. You, you know. <laughs> um, the, the Dalai Lama said it once. Someone asked him, uh, the, you know, Dalai Lama, uh, I am so fascinated by Buddhism, but I'm a Christian. And the Dalai Lama said, oh, uh, if you become a better Christian, you will become a better Buddhist. <laughs> the person, what, are you, what, are you, what are you talking about? He goes, oh, no, 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 no. The truth is already in your core, right? The truth is in your core. And, and I feel the same way about global citizenship, right? Uh, that the more enthusiastic I am about learning on another culture, the more proud I am of being Filipino and of being American, right? So uh, I, they're, they're connected. And then finally, uh, you know, there's some behavioral skills here, listening, uh, interacting, engaging, you know, um, which uh, again, would be happy to, to share uh, some documents with you, uh, Franco, that you could, you could share with the group another time. 
And what's good about Sir Brian about these skills? No, these are not necessarily like um, subject-specific skills. No, rather no. these are skills that uh, transcends uh, different disciplines and can be taught. No, um, and can be integrated across uh, different curriculums uh, in the Philippines. So this it's not like subject-specific, subject-oriented skills. Okay. So um, thank you so much, uh, Sir Brian, no, uh, for for that um, for entertaining the questions. Of our teachers, no? so teachers, okay? and of course, Sir Brian, no, one very important question by our teachers is that can they have a copy of your presentations uh, so yes. that they can use it as a reference, no, for um for this session, okay? And of course, no, something to look back at, no, okay? Yeah. And but for our teachers, no, don't worry. This session will always be available for you to replay every time, anytime you'd like to go back to the concepts discussed by Sir Brian. Okay, so um, of course, Sir Brian, um, we'd like to send our thanks to teachers. Okay? Let's send our thanks to Sir Brian. Although kanina, umuulan na po no, uh, Sir Brian at madami nang uh, nag-send ng message na sa ating chat. Uh, and nagpapasalamat po for, for your time and your expertise um, for our community. No? But of course, okay, so teachers, let's send that uh, to our chat no, para maramdaman ni Sir Brian yung init uh, ng ating mga Filipino educators dito sa Pilipinas. No? Okay? And of course, aside from that, Sir Brian, we'd also like to present um, this um, I don't know, um, certificate of appreciation okay, uh, for, uh, for sharing uh, his knowledge, your knowledge and expertise in the recently concluded webinar entitled Global Education Promoting Global Citizens and Culture, uh, Cultural Diversity, awarded on March 17, 2022, uh, to be signed by the administrators of uh, Kagapay Teacher Support, uh, Sir Angelo B. Maliari. Joseph Angelo um, M. Santos, Paula Mae Jane Mendoza, and Franco Nicolo P. Okay. Uh, Sir, Sir Brian, no, if, uh, I don't know if naabutan mo pa si uh, Sir Angelo, no? Uh, yes. Also a senior school teacher. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sa high school. Okay. Wonderful. So anyway, um, Sir Brian, um, siguro before we conclude uh, our session and we uh, wrap up our session for today, is we'd like to first ask no, a short message from you um, to our teachers. Okay. Uh, just to give you a context, Sir Brian, Right now, uh, most of our teachers are on uh, preparation and some of them are actually already uh, into pilot testing of HyFlex setup in the Philippines. Okay? Yes. Um, so we are now doing uh, a face-to-face -face, uh, encounters uh, here in the Philippines. Uh, yeah, um, so just a message uh, in preparation for that, no, Franco? Yes, sir. Y yes, um, so what I will say is that the HyFlex uh, Will be difficult. It's a it's a new challenge. You know, uh, in in some ways, it's like teaching uh, two things at once, right? You're teaching virtual, teaching live at the same time. That's a difficult challenge. Uh, I I will say just a few things. Uh, I will say number one, um, the impact on the students to have the students be in the school building even for a little bit. What a treasure and a gift that is for them. So, uh, you difficulty, uh, all that you will sacrifice uh, to be able to make that happen is so worth it for the students. No, it's so worth it for the students. And that's why we're in this job, no? just for them to learn, for them to grow, for them to interact. And for that opportunity for them to be together uh, is, is worth the trouble and the difficulty that it will take. That's number one. Number two, be, please be patient with yourself. Please give yourself grace. Please give yourself uh, time uh, and, and, and assurance that even if it's not perfect, your effort just to make something happen is so worth it. It's so worth it. And then finally, uh, my hope and my prayer is that it's 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 one step closer to going back to what you had long dreamed of, of teaching in person, right? So this difficult transition step, and I will say it is difficult, um, just remember that it is a step forward, right? Um, you know, we here at, at, uh, at, at Loyola, we have been in person uh, this entire school year since September. Uh, we have been largely without masks even for the last three weeks. Um, and and uh, thankfully, uh, no hospitalizations uh, for teachers, no hospitalizations for students. Uh, and, and we're only, uh, we have 80% vaccination, not even 100% vaccination. Um, so, you know, I, a long time ago, that would have been very scary to us. Right now, it, it's we're, we're happy where, where we are. So there's hope around the corner. It will be worth the difficulty and give yourself grace. Maraming salamat for those encouraging words. No? So, kaya na kaya kaya ating teachers. No? Uh, and again, taking inspiration from uh, Loyola Blakefield and of course uh, from Sir Brian as well. Okay, so again, Sir Brian, maraming maraming salamat for gracing our community and uh, being with us and spending your time. No, I know it's um, uh, 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 we have a different time zone and still waking up very early no, to, to be with us. Okay? 
it's much appreciated by our community. So, sa teachers, let's continue sending our thanks to our Sir Brian. Okay? Um, and again, no, we'll be providing you the copy of the presentation later uh, from Sir Brian. Okay? So, paalam right. po, Sir Brian. Paalam. Thank you. Salamat. Bye-bye. Okay, so teachers, marami salamat na for joining us once again here at uh, our session, no, our Thursday session. So I hope na marami tayong nakuha, marami tayong natutunan kay about global education. Ngayon, mas palalimin pa natin. Okay? Papasukin pa natin ulit yung concept ng uh, equity cycle naman on Saturday. no, And uh, we will be joined by a um, by a speaker from the US, kay, um, Dr. Desiree Alexander, who, um, who will be discussing the equity cycle, no, the anti-racist, Diverse and Inclusive Digital Education that will be on March 19, Saturday, 2 to 4 p.m. So, wag na wag po kayong mawawala. Okay? So, teachers, I hope to, uh, to see all of you on um, on Saturday. Okay? So, teachers, um, we'll now show you your uh, the evaluation link. Let me know if uh, it works, okay? And you can access the evaluation link. Okay? So, teachers, so please do evaluate this session to be able to get your certificate at um, https colon slash slash tinyurl.com slash global education 5. Okay? By the way, teachers, um, I have been informed by um, by some teachers know that um, uh, our, pub our public school teachers are having a hard time using the certificates from our community from Kaagapay Teacher Support. So, uh, we'll be introducing some changes in April okay, uh, regarding our series. Okay? There, there might now be registration okay, prior to the series. Okay? So, uh, we'll um, try to uh, set that up. No? So that all um, attendees of our series and episodes will be receiving an invitation letter. Okay? So, you're close pa daw po. Let me just open it, teachers, okay, for a while. Okay, so that's uh, one of the changes, teachers, that we're going to introduce um, in April series, no? Okay, um, so that our teachers can still use our um, certificates, no, for pro promotion, for ranking, and uh, for other things. And teachers, can you please do refresh the form? I already opened the form, po. Okay. Okay, not working the link, po. Yan. Pakit check na lang ulit, teachers, no? I uh, already opened the link. Um, so that you could evaluate. Yeah, okay. Working na po according to Teacher Elvira Santa Maria. It's now working according to Game Play Tube. Okay. So teachers, uh, maraming salamat again for joining us in this session. Okay. So um, we hope to see you on Saturday no? Um, to talk about equity cycle. Okay. So teachers, maraming salamat and have a great day. Please stay safe. Um, stay negative from COVID-19, stay positive in life. We'll see you on Saturday, teachers.